free and clear of the chatter from Wall Street, you're listening to Talking Stocks Over Beer, hosted by hedge fund veteran and newsletter writer Mike Alkin, who helps ordinary investors level the playing field against the pros by bringing you market insights and interviews with corporate executives and institutional investors. Mike sifts through all the noise of mainstream financial media and Wall Street to help you focus on what really matters in the markets. And now, here is your host, Mike Alkin. Welcome to the podcast. It's Monday, August 6, 2018. Hope you had a good weekend. We uh, switched up the podcast rather than it going out on Tuesdays, it's going out on Mondays instead. So when I say hope you had a good weekend, it's a little more pertinent than what I normally would say when uh, it would be released on Tuesday, even though I was recording it on a Monday. Anyway, had a nice weekend here. Dropped my son off yesterday, his first time going to sleepaway camp. He's going to a sports camp for about a week. And of course, my wife's a mess because he's he's going to be gone for a week. But uh, I dropped him and some of his buddies off with a couple of the other dads at the bus. And they're uh, going about six hours away to a big lake and having a lot of fun. I'm sure they will be. No technology, which for me, I love the fact that he won't have technology. And even though he's outside a lot, he plays a lot of sports and he's a very active kid. It's still the, the, the Xbox. There are some days I just want to pull it, the TV off the wall uh, down in the, in the basement where we uh, keep it. It's unbelievable how these kids are. And we monitor it and we, you know, we give them limited time. But my gosh, left to their own devices, they would do that. Now they wear these headsets where they can all talk to their buddies. Uh, so they're, you know, wherever their buddies are playing at home. And so it's, uh, he won't have that for a week. He won't have his phone. He won't have his, his iPad. So he's, he's a little bummed out at that, but he'll be doing all sorts of fun stuff. So we did that yesterday and, and then, uh, watch some great baseball this weekend. If you're a Red Sox fan, uh, and if you're a Mets fan, because we had nothing left, I think I told you we're the laughing stock of the major leagues, the Mets, uh, if you're a Mets fan. Uh, but if you're a Mets fan, you're typically not a Yankees fan. So uh, this past weekend, the Yankees rolled into Fenway Park down five and a half games, and the Sox swept them in four games. So, so that was nice to see. Sorry, Yankee fans, even though I, I mean, I, I watch a lot of the Yankees because they're local, they're on. But if you're a Mets fan, you're not a Yankee fan. So Boston's just, they're just on an absolute roll. But really, the best part for me as a sports fan is NFL training camps opened. So you know, I, 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 from from the last uh, when the Super Bowl ends until uh, the summer, I have football withdrawals, and they have the NFL Network, and you can, there's only so much of the scouting combine and stuff you can watch in replays of past games. So it's exciting that uh, training camp is here. And then I, I have to, I, I, I can't even admit it, but I'm back. I've got another show, and same, same guy, same. Subscriber to my newsletter and John, who recommended the American, the Americans. It, it's I watch it on Amazon, and it's about uh, KGB spies living in the U.S. in the 80s during the Cold War. And I think you heard me say blacklist was something else. This is crazy. I mean, this is this is really good. I mean, it's captivating really uh, just intrigue at its highest. I, I just love that stuff. I love spy stuff. I love that action. And and, and this makes you think. And there's times where you, you can't look at the screen because you say, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing that. So anyway, highly recommend it, the Americans. Uh, the I was thinking about something. I was reading something today. Saw something posted on Twitter by Biscuit and Basket. Uh, that's his handle. It's, uh, well, it's, and he posts something about inflation. I thought it was kind of interesting. And it was a, it was an article from Eric Cinnamon, who's a value investor. And it's something that I've kind of, I've, I don't know that I've articulated it, but stuff that I, you just anecdotally listen to and pay attention to. And, you know, you see all this 2015, 2016 and parts 2017, all this talk about tame inflation, really inflation's not here both on the consumer and the producer price level. And uh, Eric wrote an interesting article. I don't know Eric, but uh, maybe I'll try and get him on, on the podcast. I see that he's done some, but, but it was interesting. He talks about how inflation is now hitting the headlines. 
And he goes on that, and he talks about what he was writing about in the second quarter of 2017, where he talks about, despite reports of tame consumer and producer inflation, many businesses reported cost pressures and pricing action in Q2 of 17. And you did start to see that in the earnings reports. But again, it, you know, we everything we see and hear is low inflation, right? From, from Main Street, I'm talking about. And then in, he goes on to write in, in his fourth quarter of 17 update, he wrote that rising costs, especially wages, are becoming increasingly noticeable. Frequent discussions on strategy to pass on price increases, in addition to labor, freight, and commodity increases mentioned frequently. The shift from a deflationary tone in 2015 and 16 to an inflationary tone in 17 and 18 is becoming more evident with cost and wages accelerating in the fourth quarter. And I'd say spot on with that from an observational standpoint. And then as you as you go through, he, he says, listening to the second quarter calls, he continues to notice and document numerous examples of rising corporate costs and price increases, right? So, you know, the disinflationary environment, which you really saw in 2015, 2016, is now being passed and replace with rising rates of inflation. And, you know, he highlights, and I think rightfully so, that the shift in narrative from one of deflation, right, falling prices, to inflation has been really slow to develop. And he highlights that others, though, now, including the media, are starting to take note of it and reporting on the train change in trend that you're seeing. And he talks about... Uh, he saw an article, Kraft Heinz tops estimates with higher pricing and share surge. Another article that was published last week, inflation, gas prices, tariffs. And he highlights, and, and this was interesting when I saw it, that on, on Procter & Gamble said Tuesday that Pampers prices are going to increase by an average of 4% in North America, while Bounty, Charmin, and Puffs brands could see 5% increases. And he highlights what we all see, well, those of us who drive, that gas prices are already up about 24% in the past year. And rent and housing costs are up almost 3.5%. And auto insurance has jumped 7%. I mean, those are things that affect our everyday lives, right? So, you know, while government reported CPI has been low, I mean, it spiked a little bit in the last quarter. But, you know, it, these things are starting to really eat into it, in, in, into our everyday living. And it's something that I think we... We need to really start to focus on and stuff that I'm going to be paying more attention to. It's not that I don't pay attention to it. I do. But I'm going to start talking about it more on the podcast. And we're going to, as time goes on, talk about the impacts that it could have on, on your portfolios and how it could affect earnings and how it might be able to uh, help you guide your positioning in your portfolios. So anyway, so, you know, and, and so Eric brings up a point where, you know, we we're talking about a shifting narrative, right? And... Uh, you know, the narrative, obviously, for the stock market for the last nine years has been fabulous, right? Aided by quantitative easing and uh, the global central banks. And you've heard me talk about this before, and we've seen asset prices, including equity prices, uh, uh, go parabolic. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're going to talk about some things. And, and I do. I try and bring up some stuff where I try and say, hey, you know, I don't know that the world's going to end tomorrow uh, from an equity standpoint, uh, and I don't make that call. But I do make the call that uh, you are you are nine years into a, a a a roaring bull market, and things do change underneath the surface. And um, you know that your portfolio, the way you've been positioned, you might have had equities that were you know very conservatively in your in your mind that were conservative equities and. They've had great moves, and you kind of get caught up in that. You kind of get caught up in the euphoria of rising stock prices. But I think we need to re remember that things change, and sometimes they change slowly, and sometimes they change really quickly. And some, the thing is, though, you don't know when they're going to change, right? I, uh, and that's why I'm not a big forecaster for jumping up and down with time certainty on when something's going to happen. But prudence would dictate that if you're following a narrative and you're following and, and you subscribe, which I do, that things can change and do change, as, as your asset prices increase, you need to constantly evaluate the risk reward. And uh, you hear me talk about that a lot, risk reward, risk reward. 
And so I think it's something that we all need to kind of focus on and pay attention to. And uh, I, I have a guest on the show today who's really going to, uh, we're going to talk about what's been going on over the last several years in the markets. And uh, it's, it's a noted short seller who's been around for 35 probably years. Uh, and he's going to talk about the changes that he's seen uh, going on in the market. And uh, I, I, I think you're going to enjoy the conversation. He's known as a perma bear, but you're going to be uh, uh, surprised when you hear uh, how he thinks about the world. So, uh, and how he expresses the view, right? It's, it's one thing to have a view. It's another thing to know how to express that view. So you can have a bearish stance or a bullish stance, but it doesn't mean you're expressing that in the equity markets or the fixed income markets or whatever markets you're investing in. So we're going to bring on uh, Bill Fleckenstein of Fleckenstein Capital. Uh, Fleckensteincapital.com is Bill's website. And Bill has, is a noted short seller, like I just said, been around for a really long time. Bill and I had a conversation the other day, and I thought it would be really interesting to come on and share his views uh, to uh, – uh, to, to my to my listeners. So without further ado, Bill Fleckenstein, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's great to talk to you. Uh, I've been in the hedge fund business 20 some odd years and I, I never had the chance to meet you. But I know you uh, you know uh, one of my uh, former bosses where, where I was a partner, where I worked for David Knott for a number of years. And yeah. I know you, you and David knew each other many years ago. Yeah, that was back in the really old days. <laughs> when when uh, one and one only made two, and and uh, and uh, financial statements mattered, and uh, things like it was quite a different world. I, I'm I'm going to be curious to see what the world looks like on the other side of the QE experiment, uh, and see where we go, whether we go back to the future or they come up with some new crazy scheme. But but we'll, we'll just have to see. Well, you, you know, you bring up such a good point, because I remember when I started in the middle latter part of the 90s, I was fortunate enough to work for some guys who had been around the hedge fund business for a long time. And that was before I worked for David. But, you know, the Asian financial crisis was occurring and then obviously you get into the Internet bubble and, and guys who'd been there before and they'd seen that fundamentals matter, that one plus one does equal two. And you always have to kind of remember that. And as I, you know, you fast forward to today, it's people tend to forget that that uh, excesses occur and that and that markets do go down pretty swiftly. And I mean, how do you how do you think about it when you think about this crop of money managers where you know, they've come in the business 10, 12 years ago? Maybe they saw the global financial crisis. Maybe they didn't. But but memories don't seem to long, run very deep or they just don't have the memories. I mean, talk about what you've seen over your career. I think people's viewpoints to some degree or to a large degree are, 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 are um, strongly influenced by what they've seen. So, for instance, when I started in the investment business <coughs> in the early 80s, guys had only just gotten through the 70s, which were a pretty poor period for the stock market in general. You know, uh, there's 73, 74, which is brutal. And then, you know, it wasn't that great in the late 70s and rates were, you know, um, in the teens and all that. And so people that had been successful and that had survived the washout in the industry and the markets in general had a bit of a cynical bent to them or let's say skeptical and could kind of anticipate trouble. And it was almost like people that were good at figuring out what this might lead to a couple of steps ahead could get a beat on the market. And that was a prevailing thought. And, and, um, you know, because you really had to be good to have gotten through that period. And so if you, if you start to think, uh, the business slowly started to change, um, for, for a variety of reasons in the, in the early nineties, but, um, part of what, happened was the abdication of on the uh of the pension plans and, and more on the defined contributions and uh, mm -hmm. uh as opposed to defined benefit plans so people started to get a little taste of the ability to run their own money um and that's about the time greenspan started to experiment i say experiment i'm being kind to him yeah. uh, he didn't really know what he was doing but uh he pushed the envelope in terms of what the fed was going to maybe do 
and, and, and which wound up with the stock bubble. And and as bad as the stock bubble bursting was, the Fed never took much heat for it because conveniently, after 9-11 happened, the economic problems were blamed on 9-11 and not right. the prior bubble. And so the Fed starts it up again, and we have the housing bubble, which is bigger and worse and, and all of that. But, uh, and then you fast forward to today, and if you'd started your career – in about when you did or any later than that yep. you've seen mostly nothing but upness as a consequence of these central bank policies and there and while 08 was scary very scary and i think the more you knew the scarier it was if i can say it that way um the the, the people that are in business now have, have really not taken much pain for as 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 sort of out of control and experimental as these policies have been. So now you've got a whole group of people that I, I would assume, I, I haven't discussed it with you know, all of them obviously, but would kind of assume that, yeah, there's no real reason to worry about any of these macro problems. They just don't matter. And everybody who says these central bank policies don't work um, are crazy because, look, you know, stock and bond prices are under control, employment's this, that, and the other thing. And so – until we get a real accident, which we're heading towards, and I don't think it's that far away, um, you haven't been penalized for, for, you know, sort of believing everything will always be okay. Or said differently, you have been penalized for being skeptical, and I think that's kind of what we've evolved to. I, I don't know what it is the computers that are running money are doing. My guess is they're probably pretty momentum oriented, and from what I understand, they weight the prior experiences more mm -hmm. heavily. So they're just a, a, they're some variation of a of a somewhat of a, a somewhat green money manager, though I'm, that they're all coining it now. So I think the the, the nature of the environment has changed, or sorry, has has modified the thinking in such that. You know, now now the sort of skeptics and cynics have been kind of washed aside, and it's the kind of guys we would have thought were, I don't want to say gullible because that's a little pejorative, but are, 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 are less skeptical, uh, are, are winning and have all the dough. Uh, in, uh, in the money management industry, probably, yeah. that's not the same in real life. Well, I, I remember uh, in the late 90s and early 2000 working for uh, Marty Zweig at his hedge fund, Zweig de Mena. And uh -huh. Marty... Was uh, was interviewed everywhere. He was on Wall Street Week all the time, and you know I remember Marty sitting in our offices and just sitting there saying, you, you "Don't fight the Fed, right?" And that was one of his famous right. quotes. Right. And so don't no, fight. He was, he was one of the early guys to say that quite as vocally, and obviously he was quite correct. Yeah, and so it's interesting when you fast forward to here you are. You know, people think of Bill Fleckenstein. They think of a guy who's a really well-known short seller, and you and I were talking the other day. And we were talking about positioning and 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 uh, shorting and and you said something to me that I thought was really you know very interesting. You said you know Mike when when they cut in March '09 or when they you know when it was obvious what was happening, I closed my short fund. So talk about that if you will and and your view. Take us through from '09 to where we are today and the evolution and how you're thinking about expressing the view. Okay, well um, let me take a slight step back. Uh, sure. And talk about 08 for a sec because that was kind of important. So, when 08, when things were collapsing, you know, I was really pretty worried because, uh, you know, I was short stocks and um, I had a custodial account where I could move all the money so it couldn't be lost. And I was really mm -hmm. worried. Um, and and they kept changing all the rules. So, even if you were short, if you'd have told me before 2008 that the, take, that the S&P was going to be down 38%, I would have thought, well, geez, we'll be up 100 or 70 or 80. And as it was, I was up in the low 40s. And I'm, this is fresh because I was talking to another friend of mine who was a short seller in my office at the time. And um, because they kept changing the rules, we kept getting these immense drawdowns. He happened to really get hurt when they when they um, banned short selling of financials. But anyway, so they were there, there was a whole there was a there was a real move towards radicalness that had been going on for some time. Right. Um, and it became quite clear that they were going to do whatever they could to quote unquote, you know, save the system. And when they came with QE, 
I knew that that was going to be trouble. One of the things that I had done as a short seller along the way is I decided when I first started my short fund, I, I set it up to where I would always be short um, because people used to worry. You can never remember that people would be afraid if you might miss it, you know, yeah, and yeah, sure. I quickly found out in the late nineties, that wasn't possible. You had to be able to get out of the way if you wanted to. So the more I went along, the less often I was short unless certain things were happening because I realized that given the, given the things the Fed was doing, they mattered more pretty much than the underlying fundamentals. And so mm -hmm. I, was pre, I had been preconditioned to, to – I was like I, – I believe what Marty believed only on steroids because I would learned that the hard way. Right. And um, so when they said they were going to start QE, I, I knew it was going to be really hard to make money on the short side. So I said, you know, this is, that's it. I mean, you know, stock prices were down a long ways. Uh, that's not to say they, they, they couldn't have gone lower, but I knew they weren't going to. And, and uh, I just didn't want to try to be a short seller in that environment, so I gave the money back and now and, and I closed the fund down. Um, now, I never dreamed that 10 years later, you know, the market would be where it is and we'd still be talking about QE, but that just goes, just goes to show you how uh, – sorry, sorry I, I meant to make one more point. I also yep. knew that it had never been tried before, so as it was – going to take place, we wouldn't really know what we were dealing with because it never happened before. You know, QE comes along, but it, it, it even goes back before that, right, where the problems were. I mean, just think Social Security, underfunded pensions, and no, we've not really had true price discovery where the Fed's let just the market settle in for decades. So we come here now, and, and, and here we are, QE, QE, global experiment of QE, Asset prices rise across the board. People seem to forget what risk reward is. So here we are today. And um, I mean, how are you thinking about the world with where we are right now? Well, I, I think that, um, well, we're, we're, we're heading into the opposite of QE. And then and obviously QT has yep. started. Yep. And uh, uh, people, I think in general, that the, the people I was talking about who basically don't think that worrying, or sorry, or, or thinking about these things make much difference. Um, you know, they think the market's up because the market's up. So the Fed QT um, doesn't concern them and hasn't mattered yet, except for the fact that, you know, the S&P and for that matter, the Dow haven't made new highs. Only the NASDAQ has because it's more heavily influenced by the, you know, the FANG stocks, which we all know have powered a huge bulk of the gains. And, of course, you know, now we've got a couple of fangs that are struggling. I mean, Apple's been struggling operationally. It's just the stock price goes up no matter what. Um, so the, 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 I think the market's on borrowed time. I think it's running out of gas, um, and it's, it's taken a while for it to crack, you know, because it, it hasn't really cracked yet, although we had what break in January, February. Um, and I think – but I think it's going to. And uh, the, the, the problem is that – I feel like once the market breaks 15%, 20%, whatever, the Fed's going to try to ride to the rescue again. And, and and it's only going to be in that period after the Fed does this again where we get to see if if the, if the markets finally start to say, hey, wait a minute, we're not happy with this outcome. I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, there are places in the world where they are, their currencies are basket cases, and in, if I'd have told you in 1990 or 1995 or any of those times that we're going to come to a period where, where like, Japan's going to do what it's doing, you would have said the currency would be worth zero and the bond market would, would back up and the, the central bank wouldn't get away right. with that. But, in fact, they have. And so until we start to see some signs that they're not going to get away with it, no matter how distasteful we think the policies are, you, you can't fight it. You have to know that. They're going to get away with it until they don't, and when they don't, that's going to be a huge problem. But it's not very satisfying. But it's better than sticking your head, you know, beating your head against the wall, or, or trying to short the market and losing it, you know, losing money. The Fed comes in and rides to the rescue again. You know, so much of the market is a confidence game, and so much of it is, you know, is it's psychology. And if if QT turns into QE again, as you think. How does the market, I mean, how do you think the market reacts to that? Do they view it as saying, okay, here comes more liquidity, or does that scare people? Well, 
uh, <laughs> I sure wish I knew the answer to that question because yeah. um, that is the um, uh, sixty-four trillion dollar question. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know, and I don't know how. You know, we we, we really could know. Uh, I, I suspect that that um, the bond market may not cooperate next time. I, 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 my, my hunch is that while the, we start to get a break in the stock market, the bonds and rally, but if they come with QE again, at the, that, that moment in time, there's going to be more inflation because it's percolating now. Whether in psychology changes enough to really yeah. make be a big deal, I, I can't say. Um, but uh, I, I, I hope that they're not successful, that, that, that next time – they won't be deemed as the saviors. They'll be deemed as the the person, the, you know, the entity that caused this. But I must tell you, I thought after the '99 bubble, the Fed would not do it again, and they did it even bigger. After the '08 bubble, of course, I didn't expect them to not do it because I'd seen what they'd done, and they started doing QE. So now, even though I hope that the policy gets discredited when when it becomes clear that you can't stop doing it. I don't have a lot of faith that that will be the, the outcome. I think it ought to be, um, but we'll just I'm not going to make a bet that says that it will be. I want to see what people do because um, you know there's been two times the Fed's blown bubbles and they they they're still worshiped and I mean now they're on the third one, but it hasn't burst yet. So um, I, yeah. I don't think you can plan past the 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 crack in the market that's in front of us. I don't think you can plan past that because you're going to have to see how the markets respond to what they do. So you mentioned inflation and I before I brought you on I had been talking about it and it's been tame for quite a long time and you know with all the originally back everyone thought all the money printing would lead to uh, you'd see the velocity of money increase and you'd see inflation and it, it just didn't come but now we are starting to see it you're seeing companies talk about having to raise prices obviously you've had some wage pressures but the price of stuff is going yeah up, right? and, and price increases are going through and people are uh, aren't too affected about it I mean you have to remember when the Fed increases the money or increases you know, you know, monetizes the debt, basically prints stuff up. That is inflation, right? We've incre increased the bunch of money out there. So by definition, it, that quantity of money has to go down against goods and services net net. But you don't always know which goods and services it's going to go down against. Has it gone down against fine wine? Yep. Right. Has it gone down against financial assets? Yes. Has it gone down against um, art and other things? Yes, yes, and yes. Has it necessarily gone down against the price of labor? Well, maybe not yet, but I mean, and it depends on where you are in your economic, you know, um, state in life, you know, how bad the inflation is. If you're a young couple and you've got kids in school and they're not in pri and they're in pu private schools, oh, um, obviously that's ex you've got that expense, housing and all these other things. So there's been plenty of inflation. It just hasn't gone through in a way that has upset psychology thus far. One of the things the Fed, I, I always new in the business is the Fed really wants to fight inflation. So, and, and, and right. And that, and their tools are to raise interest rates. So as you're entering this QT and it really, when QT was on the drawing board, you didn't really see much inflation, but now that it's coming, what role do you think inflation is going to play in their, in their mindset? Because I'm friends with uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth and Danielle, she was a wall streeter who then worked for Richard Fitt. Yeah, I, I know who she is. I know she is. Oh, you know Danielle. Okay, and I, I, you know, she will tell you, uh, and she said it very publicly that the Fed lives in world of models, right? You've got PhDs running around, but it's very static for them. They have their models and they rely on them. Well, now you've got this nine years of a global central bank experiment that no one knows how it's going to end, and now you're starting to see inflation. How does how does the Fed react to? If inflation starts to go run away a little bit, what, what what tools do they have, and how do you think they handle it? Well, they first of all, they believe in their own press clippings. So these guys kind of think they walk on water, net yeah. net, and yeah, and like she says, they believe in their models. I I, I certainly believe that that is the case. <laughs> Depends yeah. what's going on. If the economy is is fine and the stock market's fine and the inflation picks up its head, 
um, they might say, oh, this is a little faster than we like. Maybe we should, you know, tamp it down. But I don't think it's going to play out that way. I think the stock market is struggling. And by the time inflation picks up more, uh, I think the market will be in a place where they, they, they'll just say, you know, if it runs a little quote unquote hot, that's no big deal. Because these guys think they can stop it, at the, at, at, uh, you know, on a dime, which of course they can't. But I think right. they believe it. They're not going to worry about it. They're not going to worry about it till long after they've decided, okay, we need to do something about it, and it doesn't cooperate. Then they'll then they'll worry about it. They're not going to they're not going to fret about it. It won't, you know, if the market's tanking and inflation's you know 2.4 percent over there, and it's supposed to be a two, they're not. They'll say, well, we'll let it run hot for a while. It needs to catch up, and blah blah blah. They don't care about inflation. Or, or they don't—they don't ever worry that their policies can lead to an inflation that they can't stop in five seconds. Right. Yeah. They, 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 they. It can't because if they really wanted to stop it and take the monetary actions necessary, you know, look, the stock market is so brittle with all the hot money and the ETFs and the vol selling and all the various types of speculation, um, put selling and all that. It's very brittle. It could easily crash, and it could crash. You know, between the time it starts to go down and the Fed can, you know, unveil whatever it is to stop it. So there's there's the wild card of a crash, I think, is far, far higher than, than normal. And if that was happening, they'd assume that inflation would come down, which at some point it would. Um, but they're, they're not going to let inflation w- change their whatever whatever path they think they're supposed to be on, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, one of the things I've realized is I just can't figure out the market sometimes, right? So when, when I'm positioning a portfolio, net, net my net positioning, I do the best I can to try and figure out the the macro, and I always err on the side of probably uh, too cautious. But uh, as we think, you know, you've shifted a focus uh, towards the precious metals, and I, I know you run a precious metals fund. One of the things that has really confused me uh, is how gold is reacting with with, with uh, over the last few years. What's uh, what's your view on gold here? Well. One of the things that puzzled me for the longest time was how it was that the, the gold market you know, peaked out just as QE around the world really got, got rolling, you know, was really starting to get rolling. And, um, and I, I, my best guess is that once, it, once QE became powerful enough, people stopped worrying about the consequences because there hadn't been too many negative ones up to, let's say, 210 to 11. There hadn't been many. And then said, well, geez, this is really going to work. And so they kind of lost interest in gold. So gold had its own bear market. And now we're at a moment in time where, you know, inflation is in front of us. Um, and uh, there are problems in many countries um, relating to, um, you know, either their currency. Um, uh, certainly QE has gone on, uh, you know, around the world and there are negative consequences from them. They're starting to show up in addition to the fact that asset prices got boosted. So I'm quite bullish on gold. I couldn't begin to tell you why it's been so weak um, recently other than to say that you know, there's a rather large short interest that has built up. And, and, and that has kind of carried the day because I think at the margin, uh, demand has been weaker than, us- than usual it's uh, because people don't really see the need for it because everything seems to work, quote unquote. So uh, so uh, as uh, the Fed is, you know, as the Fed's policies are perceived to not be working, um, I think demand will pick up, and I can't tell you what the exact catalyst is going to be, but um, the, the 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 market at the moment in time we're speaking now is quite primed because there's there's a when you look at the positioning in the futures market there's a, a lopsided level of short selling and a I mean, almost a record level on the part of uh, speculators, and um, I think that'll be quite a spark. Uh, sorry, that'll be that'll that'll really um, you know add fuel to the fire when some something else manages to create the spark. So I don't know why it's so so lame and why no one seems to care, uh, other than to say, I think people have such high degree of confidence in the central banks that they don't feel that they need it. Now I don't know why. I couldn't begin to tell you why the decline in the yuan has been de facto negative for the um, price of gold, other than to say gold was declining when the euro declined, and then it declined when the yen was declining, and now it's declining when the yuan is declining. It's almost like 
you know, somebody's computer has decided that, oh, this matters and then it does. Uh, maybe there's a contingent of folks in China that are were speculating in other things and they had gold and they're selling it because they're in trouble. I don't know. I, I cannot begin to tell you why it's been as weak as it has. Um, I, I don't think. I, I don't expect it to last a long time, but that's not a very good answer. I, I was at uh, I was in Vancouver in January at a natural resource conference, and at a natural resource conference where there are probably seven or eight thousand attendees, there were panel after panel on cryptos, and so I thought, well, maybe the marginal gold buyer is is rotating into cryptos and they're riding this wave. I, I didn't, I, but, but there was such an interest. By, by gold bugs in the crypto space. And I thought, well, you know, now we've seen we've seen Bitcoin collapse to, to what, the 7,000 level from 20, wherever it was. Uh, but you, you've just seen gold do nothing. So that theory, because that was a theory running around the conference at the time saying, well, you know, these guys are maybe rotating some of that money in. But how do you how do you express your view? Do you express it through through the physical or do you do you own the miners? How do you look at uh, the world of gold? Well, um, as far as the cryptos, I think I think the cryptocurrencies may, may be owned by 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 Asians and maybe you know millennials or people here in America that don't really want you know want to express some kind of an idea away from the the you know the the Fed and stuff like that. But um, you know I don't I don't happen to think that a crypto is a store of anything, so I, I myself yeah. have no interest in them. Um, I, I, I own physical bullion and uh, I trade I trade. Uh, uh, gold futures um, on a regular basis, um, but I think the the real upside is going to be in a lot of these mining companies because a lot of them have uh, a lot of them never were as profligate as as um, people think. A lot of them were, um, and then a lot of them have a, a handful of them have gotten themselves in good positions, and they're and they're drilling and finding more ore and things like that, and they're executing quite well. The big current lament that is being promoted by Paulson. John Paulson, yep. I think is is he's a day late and a dollar short on that. I mean, I think some people, a lot of companies have been guilty of that, but I think the companies figured it out for a lot of them a couple of years ago and have 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 done something about it. I mean, I think some of, some of his issues have been related to the picks that he had. Um, so I think the the the, the browbeating that's gone on about most of these mining companies is is a little bit uh, uh, a little bit late that criticism and it's a little bit. Um, um, inaccurate for for many of these companies. I mean, I own a handful of companies, and I don't feel like any of them have misallocated the capital. And, and you've seen uh, drillings cut back, reserve replacement is down. I mean, for uh, to real lows. I, so, I mean, it, 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 in the junior mining space, I mean, they almost act as though the uh, exploration arm for the bigger guys who aren't out there looking for stuff. Well, seems. I think I think there's not a lot of greenfield exploration, and but that's because yeah. you know the price is not high enough to really incent people. Now there are some smaller ones that have done an excellent job of finding. You know, I mean Kirkland Lake has been a home run. There's a small yeah. one called West Elm that I own. It's a, and <clears throat> there are others too um, that where they have explored and found meaningful deposits of. I, I'm much more attracted to companies where they have high ore grade. Um, you know. Um, in terms of grams per ton than the, than the marginal stuff, um, because then you can only win with the commodity price for the most part. So, um, um, I think there are, I think there is an opportunity to make a really serious money in some of these mining stocks, but I mean, but the price of gold is going to have to go up for that to happen. Right, right. You know, one of the things I'm noticing as you see some earnings come out is some of these companies that are missing are getting shot. Um, so you're seeing. Some stock picking that that matters. What? Um, but you know, I mean, obviously, we've seen the fangs just just take the day. You've you've seen this before. You've seen groups of stocks that can do no wrong, and everyone gravitates towards. When you look at the, the fangs, you look at the names that have been the market leaders. In, in your experience in the past, what is it that typically trips these up? Because valuation doesn't seem to matter to anybody. Valuation does not matter at all. It doesn't and, matter, uh, and you can't short valuation. No, no, you can't it, valuation, so. valuation cannot end anything. It can, it's just a measure of risk when 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 things do change. So I, I mean, I, I I learned that a long, 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 long time ago. So it, yep, absolutely. It, it doesn't really matter how crazy things get in terms of causing it to end. I have a belief that manias can only end in exhaustion. That's the only thing that stops them. 
my favorite analogy is a chain letter. I don't know if you ever experienced a chain letter when you were a kid or in high school or in college or somewhere, but I've seen yep. it a couple of times. And they work and they work and they work and then they don't. Why don't yep. they? Well, they just, they, they, you know, the psychology changes or something happens. And that's been my feeling of how many is in. That's, in my opinion, that's how the first stock bubble ended, although it was associated with the Fed taking back some of the liquidity that they injected in in December of 99 to avoid the Y2K problem that wasn't a problem. Yeah. So, that, so the money then came back, and then it exhausted itself in March. In the 07 peak, the, the Fed had been raising in baby steps, and then finally the real estate market exhausted itself, which was manifested by the very first first payment defaults, which began in early 07. When that happened, I thought, okay, the real estate market's exhausted. This stock market is going to exhaust itself. I think it kind of. Ha- I think. I think we've seen that. In that, in January, the market broke. At the same time, the cryptos broke. The cryptos are a perfect example of a modern day chain letter, in my opinion. Um, um, and yeah. they kind of just flamed out for no reason in December. That's the perfect um, template to use. And so, um, I, I, something, in fact, does help break them, but psychology has to change. And, and probably the root cause of the psychology change is a quaint change in the underlying liquidity, although you'd have a hard time making a case that any individual chain letter back in history died because of liquidity. But in any case, um, so I think the, the market's in the process of exhausting itself, and we won't know for sure until it heads down for real. But you know, we did have a break, and the S&P and Dow, as I said, haven't made new highs, even though the yeah. NASDAQ has. Uh, so I think the process is starting. It's just kind of going slowly. But at some point, it'll pick up a lot of speed very quickly. I have no doubt about that. Well, for me, we're, you know, the ones I had followed Tesla just from afar for many, uh, for a while, a few years. But I, I, I wasn't really spending too much time on it until about six months ago. And, and to me, that's this market's poster child. Because if I look at the fangs, Netflix, right. Netflix. Netflix misses, boom, done, right? The stock gets hammered. Uh, we, we saw others. Uh, Facebook had right. a tough quarter, right? Gets hammered. Tesla, I look at, and, and every bit of analysis I know how to do for 20-some-odd years, and I look at it, 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 the balance sheet gets worse and worse and worse, and nobody cares. Well, and so I, I like I, to use – I think that's a, that's a very good uh, example, in my opinion, because it's one that I like to use. I like to use it because it seems – obvious that they're not going to get to where they need to go in the competition. I mean, so we all know all the reasons anyone's paying attention. I like to use it as a barometer. The other one I like to use is Apple because, you know, their units haven't grown in four years, basically. And and whether you want to talk phones or or their iMacs or whatever, um, you know, now they've gotten more money because they raised the price of their phones and they, uh, and, and they've sold more apps, basically games and things like that, which they're, you know, they're third party vendors, you know, make, make them, they just take a piece. So I would have thought that the price of Apple, you know, it's basically doubled since they've stopped, since their new phone rollouts haven't really yeah. moved the needle. I mean, units are about the same as they've been for four years, right around, 50, you know, 50 million a quarter on average. Yep. Yep. And, you know, and, and their revenues have been around 230 billion plus or minus. And, and, and they basically, the, the stocks doubled as, as, though, as though things had, had gotten better and not stagnated. So I like to use the two of them um, just as some sort of a guide as to whether or, not one, whether or not problems seem to matter. Because if problems don't matter, you certainly can't be short. Um, if problems don't matter, I don't know if that should encourage you to be more long necessarily, but um, – <laughs> In any case, um, the, 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 um, uh, so I don't. I mean, I, I I agree with you. I mean, I think it's a good litmus test. And so, as long as things like that, as long as as long as bad news doesn't matter, it means that it's not really time for the market to go down. Yeah. Um, uh, with any vengeance. Now, I like I said, that could change very quickly. I don't know what's going to make it change because it, it, you know. But I think the Q, QT, which is operating beneath the surface, is slowly mattering, and at some point it will matter quickly because they're going to keep upping it. So I don't see how we get be- between now and the end of the year without some kind of, kind of accident, but we'll have to see. So how, so you're doing what? You have FleckensteinCapital.com, and what do you write? A, do you write a daily missive, or what do you what do you put out every day? Or yeah, I've free- been writing a daily column since 1996. And uh, I, I answer questions on my. I write a column and I answer questions on my website, and then I and then I run my small partnership that I run. 
And so what what every day when you're thinking about what to write, what do you focus on? I mean, what are the things that you pay attention to that maybe listeners could say, hey, this is what uh, Bill's looking at? What are the stuff? I, what's I, this? Yeah. I, I, I don't have anything. I, I guess what I'm looking for now is just signs that something's different than it's been in the last group of years, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I, um, you know, one of the things I kind of look, I look at, although there's been no reason to look very closely is, is Japan, for instance, because, you know, here they, they monetize the snot out of the J- Japanese bond market and yeah. they're printing money, you know, like hand over fist and you get nine basis points and you got a depreciating currency and they've got some, it's like, I mean, it's like, it makes my head hurt when I think about, when every time I think about how bad the Fed is, I think about the BOJ. Yeah. Or even the ECB, for crying out loud, their negative rates. So as irresponsible as the Fed is, these other guys are way worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's that's not easy to say. And it's not easy to do. And it uh, hasn't been. But they, they have. So I just look for something that looks a little different because yeah, unless something different starts to happen, then it's by definition business as usual or business as it's been. Yeah, it's a fascinating time. Well, Bill, I appreciate you taking the time out. I know it's uh, the, the dog days of summer here, so I'm, I'm thankful that you took a little bit of time to chat with us. Hey, it was my pleasure. It was fun. Great. We'll have you back. Thanks a lot. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Bill Fleckenstein. Bill has been around a real long time. Uh, I hope I have his genes because he's been around way longer. You know, I think he's been around since the 80s, and uh, he's known as a perma bear. Uh, but I have to tell you, you know, it's it's – uh, obviously, he's not. Uh, he closed his short fund in March of '09, or or somewhere in 2009, and that's a pretty good time to uh, to get out of the short business. Um, but uh, I always uh, have enjoyed watching his interviews, and I'm glad I've gotten to know him recently. And um, you know, uh, whether you agree or disagree with his view, he he does bring a differentiated view, and he uh, I'm thankful that he came on and shared his insights. Uh, so. You know, uh, obviously, you know that I've I've been cautious, and it's it's really hard to say when something's going to happen or how uh, the ex- the order of magnitude of something's going to happen. But there are a lot of moving parts out there, and it's not all just a Goldilocks scenario. So I just wanted to bring on Bill and uh, have him share his his view with you all. So I just want to let you know that I, I am the co-founder and chief investment officer at Sachem Cove Partners LLC, and due to industry regulations. I don't discuss any of Sachem Cove's funds on this podcast, and and all the opinions expressed by the podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Sachem Cove or its affiliates. And this podcast is for informational purposes only, and it should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients and or affiliates of Sachem Cove partners may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. And uh, if you're on vacation, I hope you're having a nice time. And uh, we'll be back next week. And have a good week. Thank you. The information presented on Talking Stocks Over a Beer is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.